mental health and musicians identity and Mark Hoffman from the University of Rochester's Counseling Center. And I, I just said to them, I want to make sure you talk about mess it up. You both do a lot of work here in the community. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Want me to start? You can go first. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist at the university. And for probably close to two decades now, um, working with each passions, um, both in terms um, students in psychotherapy and group psychotherapy, as well as working with faculty, doing consultation. Mental health issues arise. St. Dean Griffey, I'm a voice professor here. Uh, I'm a performer. I'm an uncle, uh, a brother, a son. Uh, friend. Uh, so I've been on this journey for quite some time and know the importance of not only balancing your professional life, but your mental health and overall well-being. So I'm thrilled and, and honored uh, to be here tonight. So um, I am a, an open book, an open closet. Um, a bit about my journey has written, been written about in the New York Times, has followed my whole career basically uh, in the LA Times. And so uh, I'm here to help you navigate and to know that I'm also on the journey and making sure that the future generations of performers have also a, a wonderful mental health and overall well being um, experience and a happy life and your chosen vocation. I appreciate it so much that you're willing to um, talk to me tonight and that you're willing to do this together. Feels way more important to hear um, Professor Griffey talk about mental health in the lives of musicians and the development of musicians than um, me lecturing um, about that. Um, and, you know, there is, even stigma in my field to speak out about being on the journey of having at times needed um, treatment or um, being in psychotherapy, including myself. Um, uh, and, you know, we're supposedly um, um, wholeheartedly um, believers in um, the value of this. Um, and I think in your community, um, there are in some ways even more um, fears sometimes about speaking out um, and being open. And you've been somebody who's um, worked really hard um, to reduce stigma and has been willing to be um, outspoken about your own uh, journey um, and struggles in your family and in your personal history, along with treatment and other opportunities to self-reflect and learn how to take the best care of yourself mentally and emotionally um, and to be the best human being and artist that you can be. Um, what do you think keeps musicians quiet about mental health struggles that they might have had or that they might have? Well, I think that you um, mentioned a very important factor in all of this is the stigma that's attached with, um, with the label. I've never been one to like labels, um, even in voice types, um, you know, I, uh, I don't like, I sometimes say Anthony Dean Griffey voice, Though I'm a tenor, but I sing in the tenor range, but I don't like labels. Um, I, uh, when I talked about it earlier that I uh, have grown up through the mental health system, um, I actually did grow up through the mental health system. My father um, suffered from um, severe schizophrenia, paranoia. Um, so that was very difficult as a child to understand. Um, and it is like, you know, some people are, you know, 
predisposed to having diabetes. If it's hereditary, you know, when you go to the doctor, we fill out a form and says, did your mother have this? Did your father have this? Um, so as a child growing up in North Carolina, and from the time I was about four or five, I realized, well, this doesn't seem like quite the norm of my friends. Um, and that was very difficult because then you spend a lifetime of trying to cover up for it. Or I don't want to, you know, think if my father is behaving in this way that I am this type of person. So it was a lot of me covering up. And so I grew up in um, High Point, North Carolina, furniture capital of the world. My father and mother were very hard workers. Uh, my father was illiterate, uh, but was a wonderful craftsman and did the beautiful finishing on furniture and worked in a factory. My mom had limited education. Uh, so I was a child of the 70s. I, I was, I'll be 56 in two weeks. And so um, growing up and being involved in church, we had wonderful church music. So I was a boy soprano um, and I had this outlet though I was very extremely shy and growing up in severe poverty is something that we don't talk about so much or we talk about um, other aspects of uh, equity and inclusion and um, but we don't talk about social economics and how that is so difficult and then if you add the layer of the mental health issue so in the 70s We've made a lot of progress from the 70s to 2023 in mental health. So um, as a child, having grown up with, you know, my father lying on the couch, not being responsive or, you know, seeing and hearing things. And as a child, I was like, I don't see what he's seeing. So you grow up with that fear. You also grow up with that fear of thinking, I hope I don't develop this. Um, and that was really hard because I, you know, I had wonderful church music in this and at my church. Um, my organist at the church, I could not afford piano lessons, so she gave me free piano lessons. Um, and I had teachers and people that came into my life that I think saw the talent. And I always, you probably have experienced or know the word imposter syndrome. So I dealt with a lot of that. So I was this very, you know, I'm taller now, but I was still a chubby kid and chubby kids are not coddled. They're not, you know, they're slapped on the back and they're like, be a man. So the emotions that I really didn't deal with as a child came back to haunt me later on because my father eventually became homeless. Um, my mother was trying to take two care of two kids in, in the 70s, 80s, um, and it was difficult. Um, and going through the mental health system and trying to navigate that, and then my father becoming homeless, and then I'm not, I didn't have a relationship with him until later on in my life. Um, it was very difficult. Um, and then you always thought, okay, when is this gonna happen to me? And um, and it's scary because, you know, I, I played in the band in high school. Um, I always could sing. I had I probably, you know, if we had um, America's Got Talent and all these shows that we have on TV today, I would probably would have auditioned for those um, to kind of because I really didn't see a means for me to get out of the situation. And the means to get out of the situation was my music. And so, you know, one of my first solos in church, you know, I covered my eyes like this, hoping no one would see me, and I sang. And then, you know, and then I kept singing, and then in high school, it wasn't the thing to do, but my choral teacher had heard from a local choir director that I had this voice, so she had me come in and sing for her, and so... Um, and along the journey, I thought, you know, where is music going to direct me? How, where, what's going to happen? Because um, I had this imposter sy syndrome, like I did not belong. I, someone was going to find that I was a fraud. So um, 
the journey, you know, took me to get an undergraduate degree in church music and music ed education. I thought I would teach or become a minister of music. Along that, uh, part of our topic tonight is our identity of finding who we were. So I went to a small liberal arts college in North Carolina, Wingate University. And so um, I had a wonderful education there and I had teachers, again, teachers who saw and something in me that I didn't see in myself. Um, and through those teachers, you know, I was introduced to Eastman. Um, I auditioned uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina with a reel-to-reel -reel tape with Mr. Cruz and Jerner for those alumni that may be watching. Um, so Mr. Cruz and Jerner was head of admissions um, and I got accepted to Eastman and I thought, I'm not gonna get accepted to Eastman, but I did get accepted to Eastman. So I worked that summer, um, did not have the money to fly here and do an audition live and all those wonderful things. But I landed and I was like, where's the school? So I didn't realize that the dorm is down the street and the school's here on this wonderful location. Um, and through all of this time, I had three jobs in undergrad um, to send money back home to my mother um, to help with my brother. Um, so this has been an ongoing journey. So I know the ins and outs of having to have someone, unfortunately, if they have to go get help and be admitted into a hospital. I grew up in hospitals. Uh, I took care of my grandmother, um, uh, my grandfather. Uh, so there were several things that were stigmas, alcoholism, mental health issues. Uh, and then on top of that, in terms of identity, I was gay. So I thought, well, I can pray the gay away. But I realized whatever your belief system is out there, that the great almighty or whatever you perceive them to be or um, made me gay. It was not a choice. You know, it would have been much easier to tie my shoes thinking, oh, well, at least I don't have to worry about that. But it was the 80s then. AIDS crisis happened. So there were a lot of things going on in my head, mental health wise. So it was not easy. Um, and so I came here at Eastman and then I went to Juilliard afterwards for postgrad. And then I, uh, my voice teacher there, now we could not say that this today, probably Professor Chizinski's here, but I had, the, I worked with a wonderful teacher, Beverly Johnson, and she was 87 when I met Mrs. Johnson. And she was the first one that I unloaded all this story to. And that took a lot of courage on my part because I thought if I'm gonna really make a go of this career, which has ups and downs, then I have to confide in someone because I had a pretty voice. Um, there are lots of singers here today. So everyone, you know, I talk about this to my students. So. But I had a pretty voice, but I knew that if I did not get through this in a mental health way and do it in a healthy way, instead of blaming or feeling that I was an imposter or that I had so much survivor's guilt from leaving North Carolina. Because it would, when I started college, the superintendent of the public schools, I started one college and then realized my parents could not get home because we were reading maps in those days and we didn't have GPS and all that. So I stayed out a semester and went to community college and thought I was going to be a psychiatrist, a psychologist even. <laughs> Either one would have been fun. But yeah. Um, so I studied sociology and then I started the fall of 1986 to Wingate University. And it was the, the superintendent of the public schools that said, you have to go on to college. You do not have a choice unless you're going to go into the factory and you will be able to help your family so much more if you go get your education. And so I really lived in the music building in my undergrad. I literally lived there. Um, and practice, practice, you know, tried to catch up on all the things that I didn't have in high school because I almost dropped out of high school in ninth grade. I mean, it was a lot of stress. So if you come home and you think, you know, how are the bills going to be paid? How are we going to have food? 
going through the system of the welfare system or navigating the mental health system is virtually impossible. I mean, you need an advocate. Uh, you need someone there with you because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I've taken many people to the ER and have them turn loose at 2.30 in the morning a.m. and them not have even a way back home. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I've been passionate about because it has really helped form my identity. It helped form me as an artist. Um, and it's something that once I said, you know, I can give back, I mean, because I was helping my family, but I've done a lot of concerts for homelessness, mental health, and try to speak on it as much as I can whenever asked. So it was a long question, answer to your question. Well, that's, Sorry. That's what we're here for. Um, so you said that, that um, growing up music was, you know, it was an outlet. It was a place where you found some confidence and praise and belonging, um, along with being anxious about um, performing. Um, and I think that's how many students um, who are here at Eastman start out when they're when they're younger. Um, music making is a hobby, a pastime, a venue for creativity and self-expression. And then often the transition to being a serious music student changes things um, and their new worries, um, others' expectations, the future, criticism, teachers. Um, what do you see? Um, What's the challenge when students come to college, um, to Eastman, studying music, and kind of coming from their from their passion for music into something that they want to make a career out of? I think the biggest challenge is that to remind yourself why you chose this vocation and what your love is about the vocation. Because I think a lot changed when I went from undergrad to Eastman. Because in those days, Rochester was the big city for me because we had a mall downtown. And um, so it was the big city for me. And so I remember in this very hall, because I did an audition offsite that I had to sing for the faculty in person. And so I sang for them. And I realized then I sang a, an aria, It Must Make the Good Lord Sad from Carla Floyd Susanna. Um, and the opening line, it's, uh, it's about the way people is made, I reckon, and how they like to believe what's bad, how short they are on love and kindness. It must make the good Lord sad. And so that spoke to me. And I remember the late, great Seth McCoy, wonderful voice teacher here, um, was sitting in that very back row, and he said an amen after I sang. So if, you, or if you're not familiar with Seth McCoy, please look him up and go see his picture on the second floor. Um, and I realized then, I thought, wow, I mean, this all seemed huge for me then. Um, and I had to, it was difficult because I had to figure out what I did well and focus on what I did well and what I didn't do so well. I had to focus on that and work on that as well. So I thought, okay, well, I arrived at Eastman, so obviously I have some talent, but then there's some things that I need to catch up on. And so I worked on that as well. And then the other issue that I've always dealt with was my size. So obviously I am a large man. So we're now talking about these topics that I was dealing with 25, 30 years ago when my career first started. I mean, there was a New York Times article, does the fat lady need to diet before she sings? And it was my picture, Christine Gerke, Nathan Gunn, and Anna Netrepko. So I've been dealing with this, the other issues. So there were things, obstacles in my career, but Beverly Johnson, who I mentioned before, who was my teacher for nine years through Juilliard and the Met Young Artists and then in my, starting in my professional career, used to tell me to put the, my blinders on. So everyone's going to, I can't see over here what Dr. Dagmar is doing, right? 
So you go into some of these coachings and you have like five different coaches and the mega artist. So one said, I was Rossini tenor. No, you're a dramatic tenor. No, you're a character tenor. No, you used to be singing Puccini. No, you do. The end of the day, I have to go to sleep and I have to wake up. And the same thing in teaching, though I get home at night and I think, did I reach this student? Did I help this student? How could I rephrase that? Or how could I change my words and help them understand better? So it's an ongoing process for me. And the thing I think that students, I feel, and their students here could, could speak on this as well, but is reminding yourself of your passion, what you love about your art form, what you really love about it. Because when people come into the concert hall, they are looking to, to be fed emotionally. And it's our job at that eight o'clock hour, the two o'clock hour, if you're singing in uh, Spain, the 10 p.m. hour, then maybe a, an 11 o'clock, you know, live broadcast, television broadcast the next morning. It's your job as the musician, as the singer, whatever you're field maybe your applied instrument is to express and to tell the story and it's what helped me so much through because when I I remember the AC broadcast of the Peter Grimes I remember walking to the Met and walking there and just telling myself tell the story tell the story is it going to be perfect no Nope, nothing is ever perfect. I'm sorry to tell you, we strive for perfection, but we strive for it. But you have to remind yourself, did I do the best that I could do? Did I prepare myself? Did I tell the story? And then you have to go home with yourself and feel content about that. And, and as I tell my students all the time, do not press rewind in a performance because then you're just focusing on the past. The story goes forward. And that's really important for an artist to know. Um, and uh, through all the things, you know, from coming from Eastman, then Juilliard two years, right into the Met. And then I was making a recording with Pavarotti. I mean, here I was from North Carolina, and going through all of those emotions of my family's back home, I'm at the Metropolitan Opera. So it was like many hats that I was wearing of, I'm the son, I'm the brother, I'm the artist, um, you know, I'm exploring who I am, who my identity is. You know, this person is saying I've got to drop 50 pounds or I'm not going to get this role. This person is, you know, saying I'm this type of tenor. So I was fortunate that I had a wise sage, Beverly Johnson, and she was in many ways a, a parental figure for me. We There was the student teacher. I still call her Mrs. Johnson. I, I uh, Near the, the end of her life, she said, please call me Beverly or just like Mrs. J. But I had so much respect for her and how much she took me. And she also told me after I told her my story, she said, I'm only going to take you if you go into therapy twice a week, because it's going to be very difficult for you to maneuver this career and carry that burden and still be involved in taking care of your family back home. And so I respected that she told me that. And so I met, I had a wonderful therapist that started the psychological services at Juilliard, Elle McCainfield. She recently just wrote a book. Um, and for two, twice a week for several weeks and including a group therapy session, I had these, met with these wonderful artists at Juilliard who I can't tell you who was in the group, but they're Tony Award winners, Oscar Award winners, famous dancers, famous opera singers. And we talked about what everyone came from. Because when we talk about, you know, uh, one thing that I admire about uh, um, Miss Battle, Dr. Battle, who just came on her foundation, she's like, we we're all come from diverse backgrounds. So my story is not your story, it is not your story, your story, your story. So if we focus more on that and how we can bring that together 
And I think that's a really important part of making humanity better is respecting one another's differences. And um, so. So the group was pretty profound. It was pretty profound. And, and we met once a week um, and that was very helpful in the journey. And, and, you know, another thing, a part about that was there was, um, we were signed a form that we were sworn to secrecy. No one knew who was in the group outside of the group and topics that we discussed stayed within the group. Um, and it, it was very beneficial and helpful to realize that you're not alone in this. Um, and I think the, the problem for me personally was realizing that I was going into classical music. Had I gone into country and Western, which I grew up listening to, it would have been easier, but I was going into the classical music field. Um, and I didn't think I, 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 like I said, I felt that imposter syndrome of mm -hmm. being at Eastman, being at Juilliard, being at the Met. And then my career just went like this. And I think had I had a little bit of a slow onset instead of, it would have been easier for me. And this was, but before we had, you know, emails, FaceTime, uh, Skype, Zoom, um, so when we would go sing in Europe, you'd buy a phone card and then you'd call and hope that it didn't cut you off before you got your conversation finished. So it was a balancing act. And I still do a lot of balancing mm -hmm. uh, with my brother and my mother. And I have two nephews, a sophomore in college, and the youngest one is a, a junior in high school. But family is important for me. I was fortunate enough that I was able to get my family out of poverty with these two little local folds. And I was also fortunate that for as many people that needed to tell me what my um, deficiencies were, which were primarily my look or my size, or um, that I did not let that get to me. There were days when I woke up and I thought, and there were some times that the reviewer would write some nasty comments about my size, but say, I, oh, he had this beautiful angelic voice. <laughs> um, so, and, and also given my size, people, you know, heard me with their eyes and not with what was actually my voice. So they always, mm, I shouldn't say always, but a lot of times wanted me to sing bigger repertoire than I was comfortable singing or what my voice was really supposed to do mm -hmm. how do you encourage your students to attend to their own mental health or take care of themselves when they struggle emotionally well the first thing i ask my students when they come in the door is how's your life and then i say how's your singing feeling and then sometimes it's not been the best week for them or the boat, the best day, or they may, I, I'm not a trained psychologist. <laughs> I, as a voice teacher, you have to be kind of um, aware of that. And I'm not just a voice teacher. So that's not like, I'm not about the voice, the voice, the voice, the voice. I'm about the voice, the person, the, the human being, how to have the best, time at perfecting your craft. Um, I don't like to feel like I um, pressure my students. I, I, one of the first questions I ask my studio at the beginning of the year is what do you love about singing? Um, or if you're a pianist, what do you love about the piano? What do you love about the oboe, trombone, whatever your instrument is? Because that's important. And there will be days when you do not like your voice or you don't like your piano or the double bass or the oboe, and you have to remind, I go back to like, okay, when did this feel good? Because sometimes in an academic environment, it can feel a little bit straitjacket. You know, we have prerequisites, we have a student handbook, and I oftentimes tell my students, Refer to the student handbook because we're always changing it. We're always, you know, trying to improve it. Um, and sometimes I forget what, you know, um, 
so I, I want them to find on their journey the happiness. I'm not Pollyannish, but if I could tell my younger self, I would be have much more fun. Like, you know, it's important to have fun in your work and that you've chosen this as a vocation, but it does not define you and you're not that 24 seven. In, in my early part of my career, I was the gloves, the scarves, uh, you know, I was sanitizing my hands long before the pandemic <laughs> and taking my emergency and vitamins and all that. Because if we don't sing, we don't get paid. <laughs> so singers are unique that way. And then also the fact that we're born with this instrument and we perfect it to the best of our ability. But if I don't like this piano here, I could say, could we switch out this piano? For... When I did my Carnegie Hall debut recital, I, Andre Previn had written some songs and he was a Busendorf artist and Warren Jones was a Steinway artist. So we had a switch of pianos. I, you know, these days people are switching tuxedos and dresses, you know, five dress changes, um, tuxedo changes, et cetera. So I had to change a piano because both of the pianos <laughs> wanted different pianos. Um, so it's the, the takeaway on all this is find the love of it and find things that you can sing every day that if you feel like I'm at my lowest, I don't feel like find something that whatever clicks within you that you sing or you play and enjoy that and remind yourself of, okay, when I started all this, this is what I loved about it. We have, you've stolen all my thunder. And I'm sorry. No, my, no, no, to no, 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 no. You answered all my questions without even me asking. Um, and I want to leave definitely a little bit of time for folks to ask questions here. Um, I wondered if there's anything that you think I could tell you and current students or current faculty about mental health services here at um, at Eastman, with UCC, with UR, um, that people need to know or should know or that you don't know? I think the, I, I'm so thankful that we were having these conversations that Galen and Professor Chesinski and I've met and then I got to meet you and these wonderful things that are happening and that the students know that it's important to reach out and the services are there and to speak with their teacher, reach out to you. Um, we, it, it's really important to know that there is help out there and that you're not alone on this journey. And it may feel very dark. Uh, it may, you may come from, you know, a different part of the world. You may not feel like, you know, you feel, that you have the license to talk about your feelings, but you do have the license to talk about your feelings. Um, and it's important to know that we do have this wonderful service here at Eastman and through the University of Rochester, and that you're not alone um, in this journey. And we all come from different backgrounds, but they all mean something. And that will make us, you know, it's important to know that there's no one like you else in the world even as a, a, an instrumentalist, uh, a singer, it's, it's important to know that. And I'm just thankful that we're having these conversations. I hope that we have more of these conversations um, and that you know the possibility of, of having a group um, that feels comfortable talking about maybe the good, we focus on the good things that are also happening in your mental health. Um, it's it's really important because there was a time in my life, it took me until I was 23, 24 before I first had any type of therapy. And it literally saved my life and helped me help many more people and help me have a career because it can be very disabling to think that you're alone in this world or that you have no one to talk to or no one has experienced this before. So, you know, I felt like at the time when the New York Times article came out about me, which you can Google, 
someone called my voice teacher and said his career is over. He will not be hired. And that kind of shocked me because I was I, I went into the interview. It was about of mice and men. And they talked a lot about my family and how I developed the character of Lenny and of mice and men, which is based on the novella by Steinbeck on a wonderful opera by Karloff Floyd, which was a major calling card for me. But I knew about Lenny and of mice and men because I'd also worked seven years with special needs children and adults. So I had had experience in dealing with all types of people. And as an artist, it's really important to go into, we had a wonderful conversation on Sunday and I was talking about going into hospice and whispering a tune to someone that's transitioning into the next life or whatever you believe happens after this. Um, that I sang in jails, that I sang, because I was extremely shy and I'm really basically a, a, an extremely shy person. But going into hospitals, jails, um, nursing homes, hospice, children, I did a lot of work with working with kinder music. And oftentimes they'd say, they're not going to do this. Or they thought I was going to have this enormous voice that was going to scare the kids. <laughs> so when I sang for my nephew's kinder music class, I sang for them the Brahms lullaby and they were ah! and I started da, 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 and they just were like and then they just sat there and they were like and then, and again in public schools like I went into very rural parts of North Carolina and sang and the principal said they're not going to get this the behavior is going to be terrible and I would sing high I'd sing low the when I was teaching at North Carolina School of the Arts, we had a traveling opera, a children's opera. The kids loved it. They were fascinated, and their behavior was at the best. So I realized that we all are on this journey, and music is totally about healing. When I work with my students, and my goal for all of the, the musicians here is what we're doing here at Eastman is as important as the medical school. We work hand in hand. Music helped heal me. It gave me an outlet to express all these emotions that I had penned up that I didn't think I could sing, talk about, but then I could sing about them. And then I had dialogue that I could talk about them as well. So it's really important to know you're not alone on this journey and to reach out. Thank you. Do you want to take questions from the audience first? Sure. I want to begin by saying thank you so much, Professor Griffey, for taking the time to share with us your story. I think I just gained a lot from this session. I think the question I have for you is something that we've so much as artists is really just a lot of rejection. And I wonder what you might have to say about how to handle that in a way that we can like keep going and acknowledge that this hurts, but still be able to feel good about ourselves at the end of the day and the work we're doing. Yes, thank you for that. Um, a big part of my training and how I really think that I'd learned to perform better was putting myself in all types of venues. So if I only was singing for an audition in hopes that I would get hired and was not singing between that or up and performing, then I would not have kept my momentum. So when I mentioned earlier about, I have a joke about in my hometown, I used to marry them and bury them. So on a given Saturday, you know, I could work, I could sing three funerals or three weddings and a funeral. That's a movie, isn't it? Yeah. But truthfully, I could. And then that helped subsidize my family income. But I had the best seat in the house because the bride would come down the aisle or sometimes I was up there and then I could see what was going on stage. But to keep doing it, I find that by and large students work toward their recitals or their jury. And I always encourage my students to go home and perform. The hardest audience you sing for is for your hometown crowd. And I've done that a lot. Because I remember coming from college or graduate school and then singing for the first time back at my church. And they're like, oh, his voice has changed so much. It used to be so pure and easy. And I was, and, and the, also the other thing was the fact that 
you know, I was going to be a minister and I was going to go to seminary. And then I came to Eastman instead. But then when I sang, did my New York City debut, New York City Opera debut, 75 people from my church came and then they got it. And so it was me continuing, even though if I didn't get an audition or I was auditioning for something at school, if I was not the one selected, that I didn't stop there. I went out and performed in public schools. There are tons of nursing homes here who would eat up what you're doing here. Are you a, you're a singer? Yes. Yeah. Take your collaborative pianist and say, say, could we just go present? Maybe it's dinner the dinner hour, but that makes you a better performer. I mean, if someone rolls across the, you know, the dining hall while you're singing or whatever, when I made my New York Philharmonic debut in The Dream of Gerontius, a guy had a heart attack, and it was with Sir Colin Davis. I had to keep on singing. You know, the stretcher came in. I saw it, but Sir Colin Davis couldn't see because his back was to the orchestra. So all in between those times, I sang, you know, in all these places I'm telling you about. You know, I went to sing in the prison. The minister gave the sermon. Then we, as Galen just said, is there any questions? And this guy in the back of the room said, I want to hear the big guy sing again. So I sang again. But they were starving. They were, and who would have thought going into a prison, the, the acoustics were amazing, you know, to sing for incarcerated men that they would enjoy what I had to offer. But it made me a better performer. It really did. Like, so some big things in my career that happened, I was not as afraid of because I had done the other work. And I've just sat in the back of the, right before I went on, I'm just the vessel through the story in which I'd done all the work, I, the technical work, the practicing of my scales, all the, you know, the nuts and bolts that you have to do. And then, so it made the music making even more in heightened. And then I could just trust my technique and my storytelling. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Great. Well, I just want to thank both of you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know you came racing right in. I felt like you came yeah, right was... into the last second. No, I know how it is, right? We've got to get a lot of work done. And I really appreciate this last thing you just said. Like, you have to do the work. We have to do the work musically, technically. We did do all the academic work here, but you also have to work on yourself. And I so appreciate the way you're sharing that today. And um, so you both touched on perfectionism a little bit in different ways. And I'm excited that next month we're going to have Craig Cyper come in. He's going to talk about performance anxiety and perfectionist traits in particular. So thank you for queuing that up for me. Sure. I appreciate that very much. So thank you all for joining us live. Thank you for being on Zoom with us tonight. And I'll look forward to seeing you all March 1st is the next time we'll be together live in here. Thank you, everyone. So please stay well. Watch those paws, as we always say. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for sharing sure. tonight. Just really, really wonderful over your sharing about yourselves and your